So today we're talking about God is holy, which is one of my favorite subjects. So I'm going to tell you, this is sermon number five, because it took me, we're in God, ho- God is holy. Think that's going to come up? So, ding! So we're in God is holy, and um, I want to explain what that is in a second. Um, but first I want to ask you this. I don't know, I imagine at your age you don't do this. At my age, I never did this because they didn't have computers because I'm a dinosaur. Um, But when I went to look for girls and I went to have relationships, I did it the old-fashioned way. I met them as a human, and they met me as a human, and we just were kind of like, do you like me? I like you. There are things about you I like, whatever. We kind of sorted out, hung out a little bit, figured out if we were compatible, but not today. Now, probably at your age, you do that, but there's an older generation, probably 18 and up, that they do that a little bit, but a lot of the way they find out about relationships is through something like this. Ooh, all right, okay? So, uh, Christian Mingle, so last night I told Gina, I was like, hey, I've never been on one of these sites. I need to get on Christian Mingle so I can put it on a profile. She's like, you're absolutely not getting on Christian Mingle and putting out a profile. So I think the next one is like this, maybe the next thing, okay? So it says, I am a man. I guess that's a good start. And then you put your zip code. And for many of you, like, I'll do it. I'll take him, right? Just, he's a man and he's in my zip code. Um, But he lists all sorts of stuff, like about himself. I didn't go find this guy because I don't want a guy. And so, but I was... But they list all this stuff about them, and they list all these qualities and characteristics. And, and, and to be honest with you, your generation, and here's, here's why I say this, is there's kind of a way that we look at these people, and we look at the characteristics, and we see the things we like, and we literally get to pick and choose and say, I'll go out with that one, I'll date that one, not that one, right? Or whatever you do, I swipe. I don't know if that's even still a thing. I think people used to swipe. I don't know what you do with that, right? Some of them always like, I don't know what it means to swipe. And so, but like, so this idea is you would get to pick and choose. And here's what I think. Like, you get to pick and choose what you like or don't like, and I feel like that people treat God like he's a dating app. And one of the reasons I say that is people want to separate God from the parts they don't like. And God is inseparable. Like, if you're going to choose God, you're choosing God. And so you're like, yeah, but, but my God's God of love. Well, your God is also a God who's just. Yeah, but my God is a God who's faithful. Yeah, but your God is a God who's righteous. Yeah, but my God, my God is a God of mercy. Yeah, but my God is a God of standards. Well, well, yeah, well but he's, he's so faithful. He is. He's faithful in carrying every promise, promise of salvation and promise of condemnation. That's your God. And we don't get to pick and choose what he's going to be like. Because he's already revealed what he is like. And there's no mistaking about it. And so the Bible makes the declaration that God is holy. And we hear that, and if I was your age, and I remember people would say holy stuff, and I just thought, like, I don't know, it's just like religious stuff. Like, holy, like, I don't know what that means. And does it mean long gowns and swinging incense, right? Or, and, or, like, does it mean, like, when the Lord's Supper are out? What, what makes something holy? It says God is holy. And so in this next one, I think, it says there's no one holy like the Lord. There's none beside you. There's no rock like our God. The Bible makes the declaration, and I need you to know this, over and over again that he's holy, that he's holy, and that he's holy. And so everybody's like, yeah, that makes sense. But if you don't know what holy is, what does it matter? And then we start coming up with our own definitions of what we think holy is. So let me tell you what holy is from a verse that we're going to use. In the Greek, it's this word hagios, which means to be set apart. It means to be set apart or morally pure. Now, when I say morally pure, that's one of the aspects. But the real aspect is, is that he is really set apart. And when we talk about God being set apart, we mean he is set apart, obviously from us, but set apart in every way, in every attribute. Here's what I want you to know. Just like if I were to find you, you're not just one way. People are like, God is love. It's what he is. It means more than that. He's God. 
It's like if I ran up to you and said, she's funny. Is that all of your attributes? Is that all of your characteristics? She's mean. Like, is that all of your characteristics? No, God isn't just love. He has all these characteristics, all these attributes that make up who he is. Like several attributes of things that might happen is he might be unchanging, right? The Bible talks about that he is unchanging. Jamie talked about this. Do you remember that? Like Jamie talked about unchanging. I can't get it out, but you know, if it would come out. But he's unchanging. And so what that means is everything that God has ever said, everything that God has ever uh, brought into Scripture, God meant. And he meant it always and forever. He's never changed his mind about what he thinks about sin or what he thinks about us. He's never changed his mind. He can never do that because he's unchanging. What is solid with God, what is consistent with his character, remains in his character. So, so this would be like if he was unchanged. But the Bible also says he's holy, right? So he's holy. And so I don't know if anybody's, you know, walking around. It's got something that says holy. Um, the Bible says that he's merciful. Like, so it would be like merciful. So if I had this, this would be merciful. See, here's what's supposed to happen. There's somebody in this audience that has mercy. They do not have mercy. Kind. Love. See, look, at this is taking a while, so I won't be able to do it. Was that you the first time? Yeah. So here's what, here's the idea because it's going to take them super long. They were supposed to run up when I said he is omnipresent and when I said that he is all powerful and when I was to say that he was merciful and when I was to say that um, uh, he is all knowing and when I was to say that he was wise, right? And there's all these characteristics that make him up. Matter of fact, if you have one of these for the characteristics of God, would you just kind of come up real quick? So we got all these people up. Yep, because I'm not sure if they were going to get there or not. And we're going to run out of time with it. So this is kind of how this works. And all these characteristics. And, and uh -huh. No, I did not forget grace. I just was making sure we would get here because I didn't want to run out of time. What do you have? Glory. Glory, right? And so, by the way, all of these things that look like a human brain now, right, all of these things go on and on. And here's the thing. Grace, mercy, kind, love. I want you to understand, God isn't loving. He is love. God isn't just merciful. Man, he is mercy. Like, God is just. God is kind. God is these things. And what the Bible says about these things, if we were to put it all together, it is perfect perfection in every single way. Matter of fact, it's so perfect and here's what the Bible says, that it, then it's unchanging, and then it's infinite. So it is infinitely unchanging that he's perfect in every attribute that he has. And the Bible calls that not only set apart, but he's other than you. He's other than us. He's different than us. He's not like us. And what happens is we tend to agree with God, deal with God, reason with God as if he's on your level. He's not on your level. The Bible says he's this, but here's the great thing. This is perfect. Like you might be kind. You might be loving. There's some times you might be nice. But the Bible says God is these things. He is them. And they're perfect. And they're infinite. They are forever, and they are true of who he is, and they cannot be removed from his nature because they are who he is. And this would represent holy, and it is perfect. This enough separates you from him. But you know what the Bible says? He's not just this. The Bible says in Revelation 4 and in Isaiah 6 that these huge angels go around the temple of God with eyes everywhere, wings everywhere, covering themselves because of the holiness of God. And they go around shouting, he is holy, holy, holy. You say, well, God is love, said once, right? God is, you know, uh, merciful. So, but it's the only thing in the Bible. And it uses this, this Jewish phrase of three times to indicate an emphasis, an intensity, a truthfulness that God is holy. Holy, holy, holy. The only time it's ever used that way. Why? What does it mean? What does holy mean? Take every good attribute that has ever existed, make it permanent, 
make it infinite, make it lasting, make it perfect, three times over that he's other than you, and we call that holy. And the Bible would look at it like this. I think, I think. Click, yep. And so I'm gonna put this in. Every attribute that he has, the Bible says, this is who God is. When you say holy, you mean it's everything. God isn't just holy. When they say holy, it's every attribute he's ever had. And so we know that he's holy. So what does that mean for us? So I'll share a couple of things with you. Here's what you need to know. He is different. He is different than us. Here's what I know. When we reason with God and we talk with God and we come to God and we say these things about God, what we don't understand is we bring things to God as if we're the smart ones. And the Bible tells us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, declares the Lord. Neither are your ways my ways. As high as the heavens or above the earth, so are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You don't know what I know. You can't see what I see. You can't do what I do. You are so far removed from that. You're so far removed from that. And this is what I think about that. You ever, you ever seen, um, you ever seen uh, uh, I know, Avengers? Everybody been in here for Avengers? Avengers fan? Yeah, I know, right? I was so disappointed when we lost, I'm just kidding. All right, and, uh, but you remember when uh, Doctor Strange is trapped with, uh, with Iron Man and it's like Avengers 1 and it's kind of like at the end of the movie? Spoiler alert if you've never seen it, by the way. And, uh, and so he's sitting there and Doctor Strange is like sitting there wigging out. Do you remember that? He's like, y'all remember what I'm talking about? He's like, you know what? Y'all not know what I'm talking about? Because I will break dance if I have to. And so he's wigging out. But the point of it is he is going through every scenario possible for them to win. He went through all of them. And even though that's not how God works, whatever, the idea is he does know every scenario, every moment. He is sovereign in every way. And so when I hear people struggle and all these things, could we just maybe, like just kind of think of it this way. Did you ever think that maybe God wasn't telling you no, but instead he was saying yes to something better? That you couldn't even dream about. Oh, my man, God's, I mean, man, he's always telling me no. Is he? Or is he saying, I've got something better. I've got something you can't see. I've got something with life and with meaning and with purpose, but you want to settle for him? You want to settle for her? You want to settle for this? You want to settle for just revenge? You want to stay in anger? But he's like, man, I know what you don't know. I can do what you can't do. I think about things that you can't think about. He is different than us. The Bible says, and I love this, he is without limits. Now, I'm using these terms because there's bigger terms than this. Like transcendence. Like you can't get it. Here's what it means. He's immeasurable. His attributes are infinite. You can't put anything on it. It lasts forever and ever. You can't get a tape measure out and say, man, God's love only goes this far. God's whatever. Everything that he does is tied to his character. He's an infinite being, and so it's forever. So what does that mean? It means his love is endless. It means his faithfulness is guaranteed. It means forgiveness is forever. It means mercy without ceasing. It means salvation is certain. It means that because it's tied to his character. And so when we sit in here and we're believers and we struggle with, man, our past, and man, God said he could forgive me, but I mean, like, why can't God forgive you? What part of an infinite, all-powerful being who exists as love and mercy and kindness can't forgive you? And why do you keep doubting him when his faithfulness is certain, his forgiveness is sure, his salvation is guaranteed? Why, like, what is that about us? Here's what it shows. It shows our limits to understanding forgiveness, but he has no limits to forgiveness. 
There's no limits to his grace. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've walked through. It doesn't matter what's happened to you. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. Coming to the throne of grace, you receive it in full. Man, it's, it's, he's without limits. Some of you don't know this, but um, man, I, I guess you may know this. So a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, I got, so I'm never wrecked. I need to say this. This is important, kids, by the way. I'm old, and I've never gotten in an accident, ever, till the other day. <laughs> and so I was on my way to church. Let's begin there. And I had to get a diet out of pepper or whatever, right? I know I'm a fiend. And uh, that's my vice. I get it. And uh, so I pulled up. And y'all know how dumb it is by Dutchtown. You can't pull out a left. Everybody's pulling in. There's a one lane. You got to take a risk that somebody's not going into the subdivision. And if they are, they turn and they got their blinker on, but they don't really turn. It's all a big joke to see if you can live. And... Uh, and so, man, I'm just like, ah, oh, it's like Frogger, and I know y'all don't know what that game is, but I was like, I gotta get out of here. And so, man, I go and I get the nose of the car out, and you gotta know I really like my car. And so, like, I got the nose of the car out. It's like, there's a common courtesy. I don't know if y'all know this. Let me, let me just help y'all out real quick. When you stick your nose of the car out and vehicles are coming in your middle lane, everybody understands this dude's trying to get out. Let's let this man out. Obviously, there's traffic from here. People are getting out of the plant. The Dutch Town just left 14,000 people out at the same time, you know, and, there's, and you just try, I'm there, I, all I got, like, that's all I got to do, and this lady, and by lady, I mean Satan, <laughs> comes wheeling at me, man, and like, like, I'm, I mean, you know, when you just, you like, your life, and you're like, is that going to be it, and I saw Luke as a baby, and then I saw my wife in, and I saw, you know, I just, it's like, Zh -zh -zh. I was like Whoa. and she missed me. And went right around, like right around me. I was like, how did she not hit me? And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I knew traffic was stopped right there. I was like, she had to be, that was bold. I was like, I'm not letting you in. I don't care what happens today. So she passed me up. And I'm like, well, I didn't get hit. So I'm looking still this way. And I go, and she had had a dead stop. Like she had locked it up. So my tire proceeded to hit her bumper and just roll over her bumper. And I just hear, rah, 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 rah. and I've never been in a wreck, and I'm like, oh, what is happening? Oh, you know, and I'm just thinking the worst, you know. But at the same time, I'm like, there's no way, no way I'm in a wreck. And I was like, and especially with Satan, you know, just, just, rah, rah. and so I stopped. I mean, she was so nice, not at all. And uh, she was like, man, bleep, bleep, and I can't believe you. And I was thinking, I feel the same, but I'm holy. And so, <laughs> and so, I was like, well, let's get out of this road that we all fought to get here, and let's go to the racetrack. Y'all know where I'm at. So I go to the racetrack, and we pull in there, and we start talking, and, you know, and I mean, she is angry. Like, I start trying to share Jesus, thinking it'll work. It doesn't work and, at all. And uh, so I'm like, you know, I work with kids. He's like, shut up, you know. And, uh, and so, man, I'm really trying to be good. I was like, you have kids? And she's I mean, could care less. And so cops come, this kind of stuff. And uh, sure enough, cop gives me my stuff, and he gives me my license and registration, that kind of stuff. And then uh, we're kind of waiting for a while, and then the state trooper pulls up. I'm like, you got to be kidding. My first rep, we got sheriff department, we got troopers, we got whatever. And so finally, the cop walks up to me real privately, and, uh, and he said, man, I just want you to understand. Um, he said, uh, this lady right here doesn't have any insurance, and, uh, and she's driving illegally. And uh, you're free to go. And by the way, I need to say something that was real to add to this story, which is awesome. There was not a mark on my car. I, no, wait, wait. I really, wait, I, it's not really the point. The point was, she was like, and so what happened to your car? And I was like, and the part that I thought was a mistake, like, I was like, oh, right here. And it just rubbed off. I was like, oh. You know, it's like a bug. And so then there was nothing wrong with my car, whatever. And I know I'm not just sitting there. I'm just saying the point of the story, I mean, I rolled it, and the cop said, hey, look, I ran out of tickets. He wrote the ticket on his hand. I had to take a picture of his hand. He's like, you don't even get a ticket. This is just a number. You're free to go. Uh, this lady, we're calling the impound. We're going to impound her car and tow her off. And that felt kind of bad. But he was like, hey, you need to go before I tell her. I was like, ah! <laughs> later and uh so i pulled into church and everybody knew i got in a wreck and then how was it and i was like i have my quiet time this morning fools and so so i 
got off. And here's the thing. I knew, like when he said, you're free, I knew I was free. You know why? Because he was an authority that told me he was free. I knew it. And when God says, like you're free, it's not only that he's the authority of free, he is freedom. And he tells me that. And here's what I want you to know. Some of you in here, when we talk about without limits and those kinds of things, did I wreck? Yes. Was it my fault? Yes. Should I have been in trouble? Yes. All those things are true. But that didn't matter because the one who has no limits said I was free. You need to know that God has no limits to the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace and the kindness that he offers you. But with that said, you need to know that he is pure. He is pure. He's not just so kind that he lets you get by. Matter of fact, I need to tell you this. There are no new standards. There are no new revelations. There's nothing new in history. Man hasn't gotten smarter there's nothing that has happened that God was like, this is new information. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. It's not new information. There's nothing that he was unaware of. There's nothing that he was unaware of and, listen, failed to communicate with clarity on what he calls purity and morality and standards and holiness. None of that has escaped the holy, omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, wise, eternal, infinite God. He absolutely still has the same exact standards he has always had. And if you choose to believe something else, it's because you choose to do so. Don't you pretend that you learned something new on TikTok. Oh, this lady, she's so wise. After 2,000 years of this, you know, there's a Bible, it's 1,500, 40 authors, three different languages, three different continents, and they all say with clarity what God's expectations are. And some lunatic on TikTok convinced you otherwise. And you know why you believed it? Because you wanted to. God is pure. He cares about what you do. And so here's the scripture that I just want to say real quick. 1 Peter 1. But he who has called you is holy, so you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. What does that mean for us? Here's what it means. You are to be different. You are to be separate. See, God is unexplainable. You can't explain him. Like the Bible says, you can't contain who he is. Now, what are you going to do to explain God? Nothing. But he calls you to live separate distinct. Your life should look different than the world. Seriously. If you get along with all of the world, it's because you look just like the world. You are to be separate. You are to be distinct. Listen, the Bible commands it. But why? Why do we look different? Because I can't show you God. But people can see what God is like through you. Like, I, my grandmother, by the way, this is, I know we got, so my grandmother lived in Leesville, Louisiana, and that is not a cool place, but it was when I was growing up, and when I walked into her house, she had this green shag carpet, and when I say shag, it looked like grass, about this long, with little green strands. Your toe, like, if you were running, your toe could catch a loop, and about rip your toe off. You'd be like, hey, oh! right? I mean, it's unbelievable. And so you had to walk delicately. And then every year, we had a real Christmas tree. So between the loops and the spikes, it was like, man, my mom, let's, come on, let's mow or vacuum. And, but I, and this is going to sound weird because you're going to think of your grandmother, but my grandmother's cooler than your grandmother. Her house, I know, I'm sorry, I talk about grandmothers. I'm sorry, you can fight me later. So here's the deal. Her house had this smell that was awesome. 
Like, not bad. See, you thought of your grandmother. <laughs> so, so it was awesome. And I think it was because we would track chlorine in, and it would get caught in that carpet. And then, I guess, Christmas and love and fairies, I don't know, it smelled amazing. And when you walked in the door, you were like, unmistakable. I, you could blindfold me and put me in here and walk me into there. Here's the crazy thing. It's going to be so kind of sad. There's no other smell like it. I, I genuinely have never smelled that smell again. And we went back to visit one time, and we opened up a closet. And when I opened the closet, I smelled it. Ugh. Hey, you want me to tell you what it smelled like? I have no idea how to tell you. Can't explain it. You had to experience it. See, the thing about God is, for a lot of people, there's, how are you going to explain God? But can they experience God through your life? Can they see what he's like? Because they've been around you. You know what I mean? Like, that's what they're going to know. Is God, hey, look, is God loving or are you loving? Is God kind or are you kind? Is God patient or are you patient? Is God merciful or are you merciful? Is God forgiving? Are you forgiving? Like, are you? Because if you're not, then like, what do we call that? I'm going to tell you. We call that disobedience or not knowing Christ. And so he says, here's the idea. We're to be different. Here's the other thing. We're to be pure. We're to be pure. Let me tell you something about purity. Purity is a love issue. It's a love issue. It's not a, it's my right. I get to wear what I want to wear. I get to do, it's a love issue. And I'm not going to tell you what to wear, by the way. I'm not going to tell you any of those things. It's not my place. But see, when the Bible says God is pure, it means every intention, every action, every thought, everything that he does is purely motivated for you to come to know him. Is that yours? Is, is when you speak, is your language so that it's pure? So people are like, man, he speaks different. I've had people come to ask me about Jesus because of my language. Because I didn't use foul language. Wanted to know why. Man, what, like, what is it like, that you communicate that with purity? Just think about it. Just think, like, what am I watching what am I looking at? What am I engaging with on social media? How do I talk on social media? Do I have a separate account that my parents don't know about? Like, what am I doing and who do you think you're hiding from? Purity is I do this with the purest of intentions for the purpose of that people might come to know him. What I wear how I speak, when I'm on the phone, how I engage, how I forgive, how I love. All of that represents purity. It is a love issue, by the way. And the Bible says you only love because God first loved you. And here's the other part. And this is one that really blows me away. I want you to understand something. We are to be his. That's what it meant to be chosen. People in Israel, when they got chosen, it means they were in bondage. They were in slavery. They had no help. They were desperate. They had no hope. And the God of the universe pulled them out of that bondage and said, I chose you to be mine for freedom and like for purpose to be a holy nation and a chosen. Like that's what they were supposed to be. That's the same thing for us. And here's what gets me about Christians. Hey, just follow it. When I say that you are supposed to be God's possession. Some of you are like, oh, man, like, like that bothers you. I just, I just want you to understand that I am my wife's possession. It doesn't bother me. I live to please her, and I love it. It is the joy of my life to belong to her. It is the joy of my life to please her. It is the joy of my life to know that when the things that I do, I make her smile. Why does it bother you that God wants to own you? 
He bought you with a price. And you're like, yeah, but nobody's going to own me. Well, then he doesn't own you. And why does it bother you that he owns you? The God of all love and all mercy and all compassion loves you. And he knows better than you. And he has better for you. But we don't want anybody to own us. And I'm just going to tell you something. If God doesn't own you, you don't own him. You'll have no part of him. Because one of the attributes of God is he's God. And he will never cease to be anything else. I'm going to tell you something else. Somebody asked a question, and we, we do those questions. And we have those, some, some people ask some really great questions. But one of them was, what are some different ways we could worship God? Man, people are always looking for all these unique ways to worship God. Because I think a lot of times, and I think this is an honest answer, but I want to say this, a lot of times we do it because we're kind of looking for something. The Bible says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Man, you want to know God? You want to live a holy life? You can't do it without surrender. And so I just want you to, I want to say this at the end. Some of you are like, yeah, man, all this holiness and whatever. I really wish you would be challenged to look like the God you claim you serve. He's holy. He's set apart. He's different. He's distinct. And it is foolish to think when your life isn't that you belong to him. The Bible would say you better work out this salvation with fear and trembling. Because as a believer, I need you to understand something. The third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And he works to make you holy. The Bible said those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. And you were predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. You didn't get called to be saved only. You got called to be holy and to be conformed into the image of his son. And if you said, you know what, I said yes to Jesus because I wanted heaven, then you should have said yes to Jesus. It's not about heaven. It's about him. It's about him. And if you know him, you're holy. So the Bible makes us holy through the person of Christ. He sets us apart and makes us his. And then by his Holy Spirit, he expects us to live like we belong to him. I want to challenge you when you go to your group tonight to be honest about your life. Like, do I really look like Christ? And by the way, I have to say this. this and I mean it. So many of you are glued in and dialed in and all that. And, and so many of you are. But so many of you take this for granted. Man, you get to hear the word of God over and over and over again. I want to remind you, he's holy. And he knows every time you sat in this room. And he knows every time you said, man, I'm ready to go. Or man, whatever other excuse you came up with. He sees all, he knows all, and he knows who's his. If you're his, I'm begging you to look like you belong to him and be holy. Let's pray. Father, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for the truth of your word. You are awesome and kind and merciful, majestic, glorious. You are full of zeal. Father, you are a jealous God. You are a just God. You are our God. And we just want to give you thanks and praise for all the things we don't understand. You have revealed a lot about who you are. There's no mistake that you are holy, and there's no mistake that you've called us to live a holy life. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, you convict people, challenge people to be real and authentic, and to inspect their life, that anything that doesn't belong to you, that they lay down and surrender. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.